the title for this evening's conference is Living the Mystery of Love par excellence. Archbishop Sheen says something very provocative and a bit curious. The greatest love story of all time is contained in a tiny white host. How would you respond to that statement in trying to explain it to someone? How do you understand the depth of what he means by that? It wasn't just Archbishop Sheen that understood this and spoke of it, but last century, also the author of The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a married man with children, also acknowledged the same truth when he said this, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves on earth. Both of these people and countless others that we could draw from practically all of the saints understood our Catholic faith not simply as a religion of rules, but a divine romance where God takes the initiative as one who is madly in love, as the lover seeking the beloved. It is God who first seeks us out, even before we even know of his love for us. And thus, we should be comforted by the reality and fact that if we, in turn, have finally been awakened to his love and have a desire to seek his face, then if we have the certainty of knowing that if we are, that our relationship with God is not so much our seeking him, but him seeking us. And second, if we are seeking him, we can be certain that his, he is seeking us 10 times the more. As St. John of the Cross was so convinced. The Eucharist is the wedding feast of the mystical marriage of the church and Christ, the redeemer bridegroom that we see reflected in heaven in the book of Revelation. But that joy, that nuptial mystery of mystical marriage is something that's also at work in our souls now every time we celebrate the Eucharist. The Eucharist is for us the wedding feast of our souls and the fire of his divine light of love. And we're called to be consumed by this all-consuming fire. The holy sacrifice of the Mass is the cosmic song of songs of Christ, the Good Shepherd, and our all-merciful High Priest. The Mass is essentially his song to the Father. You're familiar with the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, also known as the Song of Solomon, the Canticle of Canticles. And there we see the biblical imagery of lover and beloved, bride and bridegroom, as the model for God's love for his people and for Christ's love for each soul. And it is this that as high priest, as we hear Jesus speak and pray in John chapter 17, his high priestly prayer of atonement, of his intense, fervent desire, the fire of his heart, that we may be one with him as well as one with one another. This prayer of Jesus is his song to the Father. 
his utmost desire, unity. That we may share in his union with the Father and the Spirit. And that this unity of love may also bring about, bring about a holy bonding in relationship with others. A unity of heart, a peace of how we relate with others. Another man, contemporary person, who knew of this truth, who knows this truth and has expressed it so eloquently, Dr. Scott Hahn, who himself is also a married man with children. And in his great book, The Lamb's Supper, he speaks about this mystical marriage between Christ and the church and each of our souls. And he uses and he alludes to this scriptural usage of comparing this nuptial mystery, this covenant reality, to the image and analogy of a husband and wife, a bride and bridegroom. And he says this Christ himself, Christ gives himself, not only with his soul but with his own flesh and blood. And he gives himself to the church in the way that a husband gives himself to his bride, in a way that is life-giving, in a way that is supernaturally fruitful. Scott Hahn continues to say that this is precisely what we are each created for, namely, a spousal relationship with God. This is the meaning of our baptism. This quality of divine intimacy, this nuptial mystery of Christ's incarnation and our being in covenant with God, the author of life and the love of loves in communion, made for communion, born for union with this love. Han asserts this by saying, in the beginning, in Genesis, we see that we see we were created to be like God, made in his image and likeness. And in the end, in the book of Revelation, we discover that we were created to be in God to be taken up into the very family life of the Trinity and to call that home for all eternity. That's the new covenant and that's the worship of the new covenant. Our Catholic faith and religion is essentially this divine love story. The cosmic romance of God's perfect plan for our salvation, our union with him as the ultimate love that our hearts are made for and the only perfect love that will completely satisfy our heart's longing to love and be loved. St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, a great Carmelite saint of the 16th century, she understood this truth, this essential and fundamental truth of our faith. She experienced the heart of worship in this way. What it means to be called into communion, what it means to be invited into this love. And she recognized and experienced continuously that the Eucharist is the knot of the matrimonial bond that binds us to the incarnate word. It's in the Eucharist that we are invited to live this mystery of love par excellence. And she refers to Holy Communion as, as a matrimonial bond uniting us to God's eternal word. 
She had many ec ecstasies. And in these ecstasies, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi communicated truths of what she, her spirit transported into the spirit realm, into the eternal now of God's divine presence. As she was experiencing that, her senses were still able to function normally, and so she was able to communicate what she was experiencing. And so some of these, in these ecstatic utterances, and one of them, she refers to the Eucharist as bringing us into the pure and chaste embraces of the inner life of the Blessed Trinity into their dynamic inner Trinitarian exchange of love. And the Catechism reiterates this in, in the, its earlier, earlier sections that I quoted last week, that the great secret of God is that, we're in, that he is this Trinitarian love, that though he is one, he is this communion of persons, this unity of persons in love. And, and he invites us into this exchange of his inner life, of the gift of self between Father, Son, and Spirit. And Holy Communion brings us into this sacred, holy of holies, of divine intimacy within the heart of God himself, the within of his divine presence. Reception of Holy Communion, it ushers our souls into this intimate embrace of the Trinity's innermost life. And St. Maximus the Confessor, a great Greek mystic of the sixth century, he said, he refers to this intimate embrace of the Eucharist as the nuptial chamber of Christ. God's triune life of communion and love. And that we're called and invited in commu holy communion to abide there, in him, with him, and through him, to rest, to have our abode uh, near the heart of Christ, near the heart, in the heart of God. That's why we stay quiet after communion, because that's what's happening. As my dad would say, hello, that's what's happening. In speaking of the Eucharist as the nuptial chamber of Christ's love, another author talking about these mysteries, this ecstasy that we're made for, this divine love that we're made for. He explains how the sacrament of the Eucharist merits the name of spiritual espousal since it is by it that our union with God understood and experienced as our soul's immortal spouse. That our union with the Lord God of love is consummated in this life through the Eucharist. It, our spiritual espousal to God is consummated through the Eucharist in preparation for perfect union with the Lord in heaven. Remember when Jesus says to those, the Pharisees or scribes that asked him, that tried to, again, they tried to trap Jesus in his words. They tried to trick him through this theological question. And it was about the woman whose seven husbands died and in the resurrection, who's going to be, uh, who's, who's going to be her real husband? And then Jesus says that in heaven, there is no giving in marriage. For all are like this, all are like the angels. Well, what are the, one of the truths that that's expressing is that in heaven, uh, our ultimate source of happiness and fulfillment is the dividing, all-encompassing presence of God and being within Him. And living that there in that full, perfect life of God, which, which penetrates and, and is, consumes every fiber of our being in him. And because God is the love that we're made for, 
there's no longer any seeking the, the perfect spouse or there's no, um, there's no longer any, um, everything, about, everything about marriage is a preparation for that union. Everything about marriage is a preparation for that ecstasy. The only one that perfectly satisfies. And even the marriage, the sacramental marriage between a man and a woman in this life, in the next, the dignity and sacredness of that unity is, I truly believe, is preserved and their souls are one uh, in, in a unique way. But God is the ultimate center and the source and the summit of love that consumes them. Love, God is the, is the focus of their romance, no longer themselves. Entero, Juan Entero continues to explain that the mutual self-giving of the spouses, which constitutes marriage, is what the Eucharist affects in the supernatural order, whereby Jesus communicates himself entirely and without reserve. And Father Erentero speaks about this in his classic book, The Mystical Evolution. And he says this, Christ delivers himself, gives himself to souls that they may likewise give themselves to him and thus find in him all their sustenance to live only for him and in him. With so Christ-like a life that they are transformed into Jesus Christ since it is now he who lives in them. There's another author of whose contemporary last century who understood this nuptial covenant mystery of our faith very well and he expressed it very eloquently. I want to say his quote and then tell you who it is afterward. He says, our glory and our hope is that we are the body of Christ, which means Christ loves us and espouses us as his own flesh. We are in him. He is in us. There is nothing further to look for except the deepening of this life we already possess. Did you like that? That's Thomas Merton. And I know some of you probably don't like Thomas Merton. <laughs> That's why I wanted to say his name afterward. Finally, I want to conclude with a meditation. It's a brief meditation called Bride of the Holy Spirit. Who's the bride of the Holy Spirit, ultimately? Number one, our Blessed Mother, spouse of the Holy Spirit. And this meditation is from the perspective of Mary speaking to us as the body of Christ. My heavenly bridegroom wants you also to live as espoused souls so that he may adorn you with himself and with his gifts. As he loves me, so he loves you. As he made me shine in that beauty which so captivates you, so he wants to give you true beauty. He wants the bride to be beautified. He wants the church to await the return of the Lord as a bride without blemish. You think you will never make it, do you? No, by yourself you will not make it but the Holy Spirit will help you to make it. He, with jealous love, will see to it 
that your soul regains its beauty so that you too will blossom in the splendor of grace. All you have to do is cling, cleave to him in love.